Hey, Christy, just letting you know that the stream has started and we're at the top of the hour, so I am going to start the webinar now. Okay, I'll give it one minute after that. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I have the pleasure of welcoming you to the launch of the Global Power System Transformation or GPST Consortium. And uh, wow, uh, I would say that name has a large carbon footprint. So I'll just be using the acronym for the rest of the session. I am Christy Ullman, president of Sequoia Climate Fund, and I'm honored to be facilitating this event on the eve of Earth Day. The GPST Consortium is an innovative, bold, public-private partnership that will enable global transitions to advanced, low to zero emissions power systems. And it provides an important function by enabling system operators, research and technical institutions, and other implementing partners to work together on building our clean energy future. It's important we confront directly the urgency of this moment. The climate crisis requires that we act now to avoid the worst impacts of a warming planet. During this, what we view as the decade of action, and we must do so at unprecedented speed and scale. Collaboration among countries can leverage our shared experiences and innovations to accelerate the pace of progress. And this consortium will play an important role by advancing cutting edge R&D and supporting system operators in applying new technologies and systems. This consortium among pioneering countries will allow us to reach the highest levels of renewable energy penetration and decarbonization possible while ensuring our societies have reliable, efficient, clean, and low cost resources to grow our economies. Sequoia Climate Fund is proud to be a supporter of the GPSD. We believe this is the decade of action and it will take a whole of society approach to enable the progress we so desperately need. Today, we are joined by a distinguished set of speakers, and we are incredibly honored to have them offer their thoughts on the importance of power system transformation, as well as the value and solutions offered by this new initiative. Today, we will hear from the Honorable Jennifer Granholm, United States Secretary of Energy, the Honorable Kwasi Kwarteng, Secretary of State at the United Kingdom Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, Fintan Sly, Director of the UK National Grid Energy System Operator, Dharmawan Prasojo, Vice CEO of PLN Indonesia, Martin Keller, Director of the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, and Larry Culp, CEO of General Electric. These remarks will be followed by a panel discussion of distinguished speakers who I will introduce before the panel. We will then hear concluding remarks from Elliot Mainzer, President and CEO of the California Independent System Operator. Thank you so much for joining us today during this week of action to, adjust, to address the climate crisis. I'll ask all speakers to please mute yourselves when not speaking. And for attendees, we welcome you to submit questions or express interest in learning about the GPSD by using the Q&A feature. And with that, I am now pleased to introduce U.S. Secretary of Energy, Jennifer Granholm, for her opening remarks. Thank you, uh, Christy. Thanks for that introduction and for setting us up so well. I know so many folks at the Department of Energy have actually missed working with you since you departed our Office of International Affairs. And we thank you for the vital support of the Sequoia Climate Fund as well. It is really a, a pleasure to join such a remarkable group of movers and shakers for the official launch of the Global Power Systems Transformation Consortium. I really want to give special thanks to my counterpart, Secretary Quartang, for his strong belief in the clean energy transition and to the United Kingdom for joining us in this consortium. So GPST, as Christy said, suggested, is a little bit of an unwieldy acronym, but it just stands really for collaboration. 
GPST is one of the many rays of sunshine on a new day for global climate action that the world will see this week. So my colleagues across the Biden administration and I will be the first to tell you that the United States spent the last four years squandering time that the world cannot afford to waste. But that ended on January 20th. We are recommitted to climate action. We are back at the table for multilateral action. We are back to working with partners across the globe to rise together in the face of humanity's most pressing challenge. And I do mean together because climate action is not zero sum. While of course we each stand to gain from competing to develop the latest and greatest in clean energy technologies, we even have a greater interest in shared progress. And this consortium is about ensuring that all of us have the knowledge and the support necessary to reach our mutual decarbonization goals. So the Biden administration understands that we've got to get our own house in order as a first step. Here in the US, we have the second largest power sector in the world. At its absolute peak last year, demand was roughly 700 gigawatts. So the good news is that clean energy makes up a growing share of our capacity. But the bad news is that a growing share isn't good enough. And that's why President Biden is committed to putting the United States on an irreversible path to 100% clean energy, clean electricity by 2035, and net zero carbon emissions by 2050. And I'm proud to say that the Department of Energy is in the vanguard of this effort. Under President Obama, DOE, this is under Obama, DOE made the single largest investment in clean energy in, in history at that time. And that sparked that growing share of clean energy capacity. And clean energy now in the United States employs over 3 million people. Under President Biden, we want to quadruple down. We're putting all of our resources and our brain power, including that of our 17 national laboratories, we want to put that all to research, develop, demonstrate, and deploy, deploy, deploy these clean energy technologies that will get us to our goals as quickly as possible. It's the right thing for our planet, yes, but it's also the right thing for our economy, because it will unlock new industries and create millions more good paying jobs for the American people. So everybody sees these same incentives across the globe. That's why countries everywhere are setting out on their own paths to reliable, secure decarbonization. But nowhere in the world is that path clear of obstacles. We all face similar problems around grid complexity and integration and standardization and transmission and more. So why not work on this common set of problems together? Why not share the solutions that we discover all over the world and help other countries avoid the mistakes that they can't afford? So that's what GPST is all about, collaboration. So we can speed up our transi transitions, all of us, and create jobs even faster. The consortium brings together as you've heard, world-class research institutes and government agencies like the Department of Energy, private businesses, and of course, the systems operators on the ground who are gonna oversee the real changes to power systems and ultimately drive the consortium's efforts. So we'll lean on each other for solutions to common challenges. We'll lead efforts to assist any country that wants to help in plotting their own clean energy transition, a, a, a transition that might work for their conditions and their citizens, and we'll learn from each other. So nobody gets left in the dark. In fact, GPST is going to ensure that when countries onboard larger shares of renewables to their grids, when that happens, that their lights stay on. So I have to give a massive shout out to DOE's National Renewable Energy Lab, Dr. Martin Keller, who's on with us today, which has been coordinating this effort to this point and will now serve as the interim secretariat. And I'm grateful that my colleagues at USAID and the State Department are working with the Department of Energy to make this endeavor a success uh, for our part. Our analysis suggests that this consortium in connection with other clean energy efforts will help us to achieve a reduction of at least 
50 percent over 2020 emission levels by 2030 in this sector, while attracting trillions, with a T, trillions of dollars in private sector investment and all the jobs, of course, that follow. That's the kind of progress we want to deliver to find a more sustainable and a safer future. Tomorrow, President Biden and Vice President Harris will convene the Leaders Summit on Climate in a bid to raise our collective climate ambitions. And it starts with pledging the United States to bolder action, not just within our borders, but in our partnerships around the world. And we wanna bring the world's smartest people together like we are here, we want to help countries all over the world overcome the big challenges that they face at home. We want to learn from them too and approach this with humility. And while we may have some of the biggest brains and best scientists working on this particular collaboration, this particular GPST project, none of us individually is as smart as all of us together. So that collaboration is what it takes to build a better and safer and more resilient future for our children and our grandchildren. And that's what GPST is all about. So thank you all for joining this consortium. All of us at DOE look forward to working with you. Thank you, Secretary. Uh, it's really nice to see the DOE uh, seal behind you and to have uh, you at the helm of the, such an important institution. And, and thank you for your remarks. You. Set us off well. Um, I'm now pleased to introduce the Honorable Kwasi Kwarteng, Secretary of State at the UK Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy for opening remarks. Uh, thank you uh, so much, uh, Christy. It's a real pleasure for me and an honor to be at this forum. Uh, as Secretary Granholm said, there's so many experts, uh, so many uh, people who have a, a huge degree of experience as well in what is a vitally important uh, sector. What I would say is, I, in my experience over two years now nearly as an energy minister, uh, the, the system operators, the work that uh, members of GPST do uh, uh, is critically important. In fact, in terms of our uh, race to net zero, balancing the system, supplying electricity to millions of uh, homes, uh, is a hugely important uh, task. And in, in terms of net zero, the challenge uh, for net, of net zero, I can't think of any uh, sector of people, group of people who are more integral uh, to that, uh, to meeting that challenge. So I'm delighted uh, to be at this forum. The other thing I'm very pleased about uh, was hearing Senate, uh, Secretary Granham's remarks about the re-engagement of the US government in what is a, a critically important a lethally uh, important uh, issue. And it's very, very good uh, that uh, President Biden uh, and his capable team are fully engaged uh, with the fight against uh, climate change. And it's been an honor and a privilege for me personally uh, to get to meet uh, and to uh, get to know Senator, uh, forgive me, uh, Secretary Granham uh, in her new role. And I, I welcome her uh, to that position. I think I wanted to uh, really, uh, I had prepared remarks, but I thought that some of the things that uh, Secretary Granham uh, uh, remarks she made uh, were, were things that I, I really struck a chord with me. I think uh, the idea, and to use her phrase, of shared progress is really important. Uh, yes, uh, com uh, companies and countries can compete, but I think the shared progress, the fact that this is a global challenge uh, and the fact that we're gonna have to come up with global solutions is really important. Uh, and I think that was something that, uh, a point that she made extremely uh, effectively. Uh, she also pointed out that uh, President Biden has really uh, exceeded expectations in the, the scale of the ambition, the quadrupling of uh, jobs from 3 million to 12 million in this uh, critically important field, uh, I think was uh, an inspiration for all of us. And what we're doing uh, in this year of COP26, which we, have the honor of hosting, is really trying to uh, affect change and drive progress. Uh, and one of the things that I was very uh, pleased to see was the energy transition uh, councils that we've, council that we've set up, uh, working uh, across uh, the world, other partners across uh, uh, the globe uh, to try and drive progress uh, in this area. Here in the UK, uh, we are proud of our record. Uh, we have uh, reduced carbon emissions since 1990. 
by nearly 45%. While in that time, uh, the economy has grown by nearly 80%. Uh, so we've li a lived experience of how reducing uh, uh, carbon emissions and, and trying to lead, leading the charge against uh, climate change to reverse it uh, isn't incompatible uh, with economic growth. And that's something that we want to reinforce uh, this year in the year of COP26. Uh, we have uh, uh, ministerial uh, engagement. Uh, we also have COP26 green grid initiatives that I know many of you are, are engaged with. And we feel uh, that uh, COP26 is really an opportunity to accelerate our efforts because the time is short. And as Secretary Granham said, uh, we have to think about future generations, yet the time with which we have uh, to deal with the problem is a short one. And we feel, uh, as many of you do, as all of you do, that targeted practical cooperation uh, through forums, vitally important forums like the GPST Consortium, as well as the missions, uh, is really the first step uh, to dealing with uh, this problem. Uh, collaboration is clearly very important. Shared progress is absolutely what we're aiming for. Uh, and I'm delighted to see the United States uh, come back uh, into the international fold on this particular subject and really uh, provide a, a degree of energy, uh, no pun intended, uh, and enthusiasm uh, for which we're all extremely grateful. I look forward to hearing uh, contributions from uh, friends, from colleagues. Very pleased that uh, Finton Sly uh, who has worked so hard uh, with the electric uh, electricity system operator here in the UK as part of National Grid uh, is on this panel. Uh, and I look forward to hearing from, from him uh, and from many others as well in the course of what I think is going to be a, a really, really important conversation. So thank you. I'm delighted to be uh, taking part uh, in this forum. And I look forward to engaging with many of you now and in, in the weeks and months ahead uh, on this critically important subject. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary, and thank you for providing a nice segue to uh, Fintan Sly, uh, who we're turning to next. I'd like to introduce him as the director of the UK National Grid Energy System Operator and um, introduce him for his remarks on behalf of the GPST founding system operators to discuss the value of the GPST. Thanks. Super, thank you very much uh, for that welcome. And thank you also to Secretary Granholm and Secretary of State Quartang for their support and engagement uh, here today. As you just heard, my name is Fintan Sly from the Electricity System Operator, part of the National Grid Group of Companies, and we run the electricity system in Great Britain. And we're one of the founding members of the Global Power System Transformation Initiative. And as its current chair, I wanted to say a few words about why we established it and what we hope to achieve. But before I do that, I just wanted to acknowledge and recognize the contribution, contribution of Audrey Zibelman, who was the inaugural chair, and also Steve Burbeck, who both of whom were instrumental in getting this initiative off the ground. So about 18 months ago, prompted by some of the leading thinkers in the area of renewables integration, such as Mark O'Malley at NREL, Tim Green at Imperial, Charlie Smith at ESIG, and many others, a small group of CEOs from around the world came together to discuss and explore how to address the unprecedented technical and operational challenges we were facing in integrating large amounts of renewable energy onto our systems. As a group, we share a common view that climate change is an imperative that must be addressed and urgent action is required. And indeed moving to a more sustainable net zero electricity system is a key enabler in all of this. And further as CEOs of electricity system operators who are at the forefront of this transition, we felt we had an opportunity to make a difference, to accelerate that transition on a global basis. But with that opportunity comes an obligation and indeed for us a desire to act, to step up, to do the right thing and provide leadership and make a difference, not just for the customers we serve, but for society and communities everywhere. And so the Global Power System Transformation Initiative was born with AMO from Australia, EnergyNet from Denmark, AirGrid from Ireland, CalISO from the US, 
and ourselves from the UK as the founding system operators. And the initiative had two broad goals. First, to align the best research minds and the best research institutions globally around those key real world challenges faced in operating electricity systems with very high and increasing levels of renewable generation. And second, to disseminate those findings broadly and widely to help other jurisdictions and system operators to embrace and successfully manage increasing levels of renewable generation on their systems. So on the first of these, building a focused research agenda, we're working with the leading research institutions and you'll hear from Martin from NREL shortly to talk a little bit more about that and where we're working to define those priority areas of focus. As system operators, this allows us to guide the research effort to those areas which have the most impact in enabling higher levels of renewable penetration on our electricity systems, while also providing real life data, expertise, testing environments for researchers facilitating an ever closer and highly collaborative partnership between industry and academia. But as I noted earlier, and it was stressed in the earlier speeches, this is not just about pushing the boundaries and improving the sustainability of our five power systems. Our second broad goal is to facilitate the scaling of this across other systems and geographies. Therefore, as part of this initiative, we're working directly with countries who are earlier in their decarbonization journey. And you'll hear from one of them, the Indonesian system operator shortly. We'll also be using existing networks and initiatives such as the Powering Pass Coal Alliance, the GO15 network of the largest grid operators in the world, NSOE from Europe, Seagrate and many others to help share those learnings and expertise openly and broadly. Alongside this, we're also working on the skills, capabilities, tools, and systems necessary to help others scale their level of renewables at speed. And to drive this forward, the GPST initiative includes pillars around workforce development, localized technology adoption, and open data and tools, which bring together some of the leading organizations to advance the thinking in these areas, but also importantly, to ensure that the dissemination of learnings and expertise is done in a manner that's tailored to the specific needs of individual electricity systems, jurisdictions, or countries. I'd like to conclude by stressing that this initiative is not a talking shop. It's about taking action. It's about having impact. It's about making a difference. And on behalf of the five CEOs, Elliot from CalISO, Mark from Airgrid, Michael from AMO, Thomas from Denmark, and myself. We're absolutely delighted to see the formal launch here today. And indeed, we've been humbled by the amount of support that we have received to date. We feel passionately that energy systems must transform to be more sustainable. And therefore, individually and collectively, we want to ensure that we play our part, that we step up and that we meet this global challenge with a global response, with the urgency and sense of purpose necessary to ensure a healthy planet for our children and our grandchildren to enjoy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fenton. I'd now like to turn it uh, to Dharmawan Prasojo, Vice CEO of PLN for remarks on their collaboration with GPST. It is uh, an honor to be here uh, in this such an eminent event. And um, let me ask you a question why PLN is here to, tonight. It's actually, we are here with one purpose of all. We are here to be part of this exciting movement to ensure that the next generation is having better future than current generations. How exactly are we going to do it? We're going to do it by reducing CO2 carbon emissions to prevent further damage. And PLN is the power and utility company of, uh, of uh, in the national power and utility company in Indonesia. 
we serving 80 million customers roughly and our sizing of the sector is roughly 300 terawatt hour every single year and moving forward by 2060 the size uh, the demand growth annually is roughly 4.6 percent meaning in by 2060 the size of the sector of electricity is roughly 1800 terawatt hour so there will be additional capacity of 1500 terawatt hour uh, in the next uh, of, of 30 years and we are here to announce that this additional capacity is going to be fully dominated by renewable energy instead of fossil fuel. We also fully committed to transition from fossil fuel to renewable energy. By 2030, we're going to retire the subcritical coal-fired power plants, the first phase. And by 2035, we're going to retire the second phase of subcritical. And then by 2040, we're going to retire the critical. And then by 2050, we're going to give our best effort to be carbon neutral. And then by 2032, our contract uh, with the LNG long-term contract is going to expire. We're going to replace also this gas fire power plants with renewable energy. And of course, PLN cannot do this alone. We need to collaborate. We have a dream in the next eight years that fossil fuel is going to be beaten by renewable energy as a base load. So, we have a dream that we don't need any, any kind of policy, we don't need any kind of a, you know, international agreement, but human innovates. We, we have a vision that renewable energy as a base load can beat from technical point of view, from economic point of view, from commercial point of view, able to compete with fossil fuel. Hence, we understand right now that generation of renewable energy is becoming very cheaper but the, the storage cost is still very expensive, roughly 12, 13 cents. But in the future, when human innovates and storage cost can decrease to only two, three cents, four cents, then this base load of renewable energy is going to be able to come into the system, not because of policy, because of competition, the fossil fuel is going to be a little bit pricey than renewable energy. And then in the future, we also transition from oil-based transportation to renewable-based uh, transportation, meaning that we shift from oil-based transportation to electric-based using electric and uh, electric vehicle. And we believe that this GPS is actually a global platform exactly to do that. We are going to set the transformation action toward renewable energy integration. We are going to be able to address emerging power system workforce need, and we need to ensure that power system transformation can be an engine for economic growth. So we are very excited to be part of this GPST movement, and uh, we are looking forward to have a more productive collaboration. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I just want to take a, a moment to remind panelists to please keep your remarks short. We're tracking about five minutes behind. Um, and with that, I'd like to turn to National Renewable Energy Laboratory Director Martin Keller uh, for remarks on behalf of the GPST core team on the role of research institutions in teaming with private sector in advancing the GPST. Um, thank you, Christy. So first, let me let me thank all Enrellians who worked really hard to, to make this event a reality, especially Ron Benioff and his whole team and Mark Malley, uh, who was one of the original brains, so to speak, to get this consortium going. So NREL is incredibly pleased to be uh, joining with public research and private system operator institutions to be moving the needle on innovative research and targeted support to get the highest levels of renewables on the power grid in all regions. So for those of you who do not know NREL, we are one of the 17 United States Department of Energy National Laboratories. And NREL's mission is to advance the science and engineering of energy efficiency, sustainable transportation, and renewable power technologies to provide the knowledge to integrate and optimize energy systems. For more than 40 years, Annual scientists and engineers have been developing technologies for the clean energy transition and reducing the cost of bringing them to market. A recent example is our groundbreaking Los Angeles Renewable Energy Study, more popularly called LA100, which offers analytic insights at an unprecedented scale. To conduct this study, annual researchers collaborated with uh, political community and energy leaders in Los Angeles. Our scientists, uh, employed over 100 million high-performance computing simulations 
to gain infrastructure insights, understand the critical role of biofuels, determine the best ways to meet power needs, and gather rooftop voltaic details down to the building level for the region. LA100 is exciting because the results demonstrate a clear path forward for all communities to integrate higher levels of renewable energy while continuing to provide reliable, safe, and cost-effective energy to customers. Another thing I want to, uh, you to know about Enrol is that we are committed to continuously developing more innovative ways to engage industry and drive deployment for renewable energy toward the future. Toward this end, we currently have more than 900 partnerships with industry, academia, and government. Having provided this brief background about Enrol, I now want to talk about the belief of all of us here today share that we are collectively at an exciting precipice for massive expansion of renewable energy in the bulk power system and beyond, giving rapidly declining technology costs and innovation. Within this context, we are honored to serve as the GPSC Interim Secretariat and to work together with 10 other world-renowned technical institutions on the GPST core team that we are representing for the GPST launch today. Also, we are excited to announce the release of a cutting edge consensus-based research agenda that was produced by the GPST founding system operators that you will hear from later today, together with the core team. The research agenda is a first of its kind product of ident identifies the most pressing and important research areas that will allow system operators and utilities to decarbonize power systems and prepare our grids for 100% or near 100% renewable energy integration. You can find the research agenda on the GPST website, www.globalpst.org. Why is this research agenda so significant? First, it is driven by leading edge industry partners and validated by leading system operators who are deeply invested and committed to, be, to being industry partners during research efforts. It is a consensus-based research agenda by six leading system operators who will both partner on the research and share information globally. It creates an authentic opportunity for impact. And it, as industry partners stand ready to take research insights and apply them immediately and share knowledge and replicate pioneering solutions across countries around the world. With all of this in mind, we are now at a point where we can pursue these research opportunities through public-private partnerships with industry leaders and through collaboration across government and achieve ambitious grid goals. With our emerging economy partners, core team and founding system operators, we are also focused on transfer of knowledge globally on advanced operational and engineering solutions to reach the highest levels of grid renewable penetration possible. Enrol and the full GST, uh, GPST core team are also incredibly excited to be partnering with PLN in Indonesia, ESCOM in South Africa, POSOCO in India and NLDC in Vietnam to support them as leaders in advancing power system transformation. You will hear from all of these leaders today on their power system challenges and solutions they are pursuing in collaboration with the GPST. Furthermore, we have other high impact pillars of work under the GPST, including workforce development led by Imperial College in London to ensure we upskill our current workforce and have bright young minds ready to implement innovative solutions and operate advanced grids. In addition, we are pleased to announce today the release of the GPST teaching agenda led by Imperial College that identifies forward-looking ideas, uh, areas where curriculum and course development is critical to prepare the workforce for high levels of renewable penetration. You can find the teaching agenda on our website. Another pillar of the GPST focuses on technology standards, testing and certification led by IEEE to localize technologies to unique contexts around the globe. And finally, the GPST also has a pillar of activities focused on open tools and data led by VTT in Finland to support broad dissemination, improvement and development of high quality open tools and data for system operators around the world. Again, we could not be more honored to be representing the ent entire GPST core team here today, and we are excited for much progress to be made in the coming months. Thank you for your uh, attending this event today, and we are thrilled to be part of this exciting launch event for the GPST consortium together with our outstanding partners. Thanks so much, Martin. 
I'd now like to turn it to uh, General Electric CEO, Larry Culp for a private sector perspective. Thank you. We're honored to be part of the launch here this morning of the Global Power System Transformation Consortium. At GE, we share the goals of both President Biden and the GPST in first setting an ambitious target for reducing greenhouse gases, and second, building a resilient grid at the very same time. We know that these goals are mutually achievable. GE was among the original innovators of the electric grid more than 100 years ago. Our history goes back to Edison, and we continue that tradition of innovation today. Together with our customers, we provide one third of the world's energy. 90% of power transmission utilities worldwide have been equipped with our technology, and 40% of the world's energy is managed with GE software. Last year, we invested over a billion and a half dollars in R&D in these areas and others to drive innovation. With businesses that span the energy sector, we believe that the fastest way to decrease emissions is through a combination of wind, gas, and a modernized grid. Grid's role in meeting our future energy needs is especially important. We can't simply add more energy generation alone. We need a grid that can efficiently and effectively manage the energy wind turbines, solar farms, and other new technology generates. These two paths are intertwined. We won't be fully successful in growing renewable energy without succeeding in modernizing the grid. Specifically, we must make the grid more resilient in light of four growing threats. One, increased and more severe weather. Two, capacity to manage the variability of increased renewable energy, three, underlying growth and demand, and four, the challenge of cybersecurity. Fortunately, the tools exist today to build grid resilience for the clean energy of tomorrow. We have existing physical technology to smooth variability and increase efficiency so we can bring power online reliably from wind and solar farms across the country. This ensures electrical grids continue to maintain the voltage and frequency of the AC power traveling their lines. For example, synchronous condensers can be used to bolster the voltage on transmission lines. As we build more renewable energy generation, we should use this technology to help utilities cost effectively send power over longer distances with lower losses, increasing efficiency and stability. Software is also key to a more resilient grid. Digital tools can help the hardware better manage the transmission and distribution from diverse and variable sources in real time and can provide a holistic view of the full energy ecosystem. Importantly, software can also help operators prepare for potential problems by predicting issues and forecasting risks such as severe weather. Grid modernization can make our energy ecosystem more sustainable. For example, GE has developed a synthetic green gas that is revolutionizing high voltage equipment by offering grid operators an alternative to insulating SF6 gas, an extremely potent greenhouse gas. When combined, these physical and digital grid upgrades become the facilitator of a successful, sustainable energy transformation. These opportunities not only make our grid more resilient while accelerating clean energy, but as Secretary Graham Holt indicated earlier, they also drive economic opportunities around the world. In the near term, grid modernization presents one of the best opportunities for development. The technology is ready to deploy today and investments in the grid will enable more jobs in manufacturing and installation. Longer term, a resilient grid will make the nation's infrastructure more resilient and help economies thrive. We'll be better prepared to ensure reliable, affordable, and cleaner energy, which is a critical catalyst for economic growth and prosperity. So we at GE commend the GPST for its leadership in this critical space. And I wanna personally thank President Biden, Secretary Granholm, and the many other leaders involved in convening this week's summit. You can count on GE as a partner in securing that brighter, energy future. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. That concludes uh, our, our initial set of speakers. And I think 
we can really hear the momentum uh, towards achieving progress in the sector. I'd now like to move us into our roundtable discussion, and I'll start with a set of introductions to our distinguished speakers. Uh, the roundtable will include KVS Baba, Chairman and Managing Director of Pasoco India, Cesar Butron, President of COES Peru, Thomas Egebo, CEO and President of EnergyNet Denmark, Michael Gatt, CEO of the Australian Energy Market Operator, and Andre D. Ryder, Group CEO of ESCOM Holdings South Africa. I'll start with a set of questions that I'd like each speaker to take about two minutes to respond to, and please note the time. The first question I would like to direct to Michael Gatt and Cesar Boutron. What do each of you see as the main challenges to reach the highest penetrations of renewable energy, and how can the GB GPST help address these challenges? Thank you, Christy. Uh, in the Australian context, the Australian national electricity market is quite unique, spanning the east coast of Australia and over 5,000 kilometres um, of grid. So it's, it's kind of unusual. It's got some unique characteristics with about 15 gigawatts of uh, minimum demand and about 35 gigawatts of peak demand and a comparatively low customer density. So uh, yeah, in its own right, it throws up some unique challenges. Um, it's also supported by about 10 and a half gigawatts of uh, solar and PV, um, which is growing at around two gigawatts each year. So we're, we're rapidly integrating new large scale wind and solar and progressively displacing the existing fleet with about 63% of the coal fleet uh, scheduled to retire in the next 20 years. Um, it's an interesting backdrop, but herein lies a challenge uh, for us. Uh, our central challenge is likely to be operating the power system for periods with fewer and fewer synchronous generators online without risking uh, system security or safety. Um, the challenge for us seems to be the delicate balance um, during the transition between proven technologies that support the transition while encouraging new and emerging technologies such as battery, batteries and grid forming inverters um, to enable their capability on networks. We're seeing opportunities in new technologies, including through the integration of large scale batteries, which have shown the ability to improve reliability and security of the power system uh, through the provision of dispatchable capacity, as well as rapid response to contingency events. Um, in the Australian context, uh, we need to carefully manage weather, um, particularly weather related uncertainty on the power system. Um, in particular, we need to assess and mitigate risks associated with high impact and low probability events, such as extreme weather and bushfire events. Some recent events on our power system have highlighted the key challenges of managing a high proportion of inverter-based resources, um, not only in the real-time operational challenges, but the challenges for accurate demand forecasting, weather models, outage planning and coordination, with high distributed PV and fewer synchronous machines online. Um, we've also had periods where both um, you know, distributed PV and grid scale solar have met 100% of the local demand in South Australia, um, with gas generators predominantly online to provide some system security and exporting energy uh, through to other states. That gets us back to the role of the GPST, um, obviously a forum for sharing and collaboration. Uh, it's well documented. Um, and really at the forefront of these challenges. Um, the GPST can help to guide some of our research activities, that's absolutely ideal, and aligned with solving the ch challenges faced by operators day to day. I can't think of anything better than sharing some of our challenges with the smartest people that the industry has to offer, Christy. Thanks so much. Over to you, Cesar. Thank you very much, Christy. Thank you for the invitation and for all the assistance we, we are getting from GPST. Um, I think that in our case, uh, Peru system is a very small system, but uh, we are based mostly on hydropower and natural gas and domestic natural gas. And the main challenge in, in Peru is the low price of electricity because our gas is very cheap and we have plenty of gas and, and the next uh, is hydro. So being so cheap, the price of electricity, it's been very difficult to uh, increase the penetration of renewables because up to date, uh, most renewables had higher price 
than the current price in the market, in the Peruvian market. But this is going to change because gas is not forever. It's not unlimited. And uh, developing more hydropower stations is each day more difficult. There, there's a lot of environmental uh, problems and social problems. So we know that uh, we have to change and then in the growth of the system should be based on renewables. So that being solved that problem, the next issue is that uh, Peru has to take a political decision. We, we still need a political decision to embrace this program. And after this decision is taken, uh, what we need is to develop a regulatory framework that is capable of stating rules that would attract investment, private investment in renewable energies. Because being a, a small country in a not rich country, the state doesn't have enough resources. So we need private investment. So first we have to develop this regulatory framework well enough designed. And after that, we have to address all the technical challenges that comes with the uh, the penetration, the increase of penetration of renewables. And in these two last issues is where GPST help is very important. You, uh, all the members have enough experience and knowledge to help us to develop this, this regulatory framework and to address one by one all the technical issues that maybe you have solved before. And so we have a lot to learn. So this is what we see the challenges in the, in the very, very important uh, capability of GPST to help us to continue this, this uh, objective of reaching a, a clean energy sector. Thank you. Thank you, Cesar. I think it's clear where GSPT is gonna have its comparative advantage. Um, I'd like to turn it to ESCOM next, to Andre D. Ryder, um, hopefully, they are not having technical difficulties. So I'll ask the question if, if, if they do, if they are, uh, there, there they are. Um, what are the main challenges facing ESCOM and South Africa's transition towards an increasingly diversified energy mix driven by variable renewables? And how can collaborations like GPSD amongst others assist ESCOM in implementing and enabling this transition? Thanks, Christy, and good afternoon to all the distinguished guests on the panel. Um, South Africa's power system is predominantly coal-based. In fact, we've got the dubious distinction of being the biggest carbon emitter on the African continent, and we would like to change that. So we have embarked on an intentional policy shift to move increasingly to renewable energy. We believe that uh, it holds great promise for us to decarbonize our economy. Uh, at the same time as ensuring that there is a just transition uh, for communities that have hitherto been invested in the coal value chain. Um, from a system operator perspective, we have a good appreciation and understanding of the risk and uncertainty uh, that comes with operating a diverse system. However, once you add the uh, new dimension of uncertainty introduced by a non-dispatchable and variable renewable energy, the well-defined lines between planning and operations become quite blurred. Um, we therefore uh, feel that there is a need uh, for us to rethink and upgrade some of the tools and methods that we have used uh, successfully, I might add, um, to accommodate this new and greater degree of variability that we anticipate moving and migrating to increased use of renewable energy. And in this uh, instance, peer learning with other system operators from around the world is going to be essential for us to leverage off uh, that platform. And we think that um, the GPST is a great platform to enable us to do exactly that. And we look forward to collaborating and sharing this learning experience as we all embark on this journey of decarbonization. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. Uh, I'd now like to turn it to KBS Baba and Thomas Igebo. How quickly can the world's power systems get to near 100% renewable energy penetration 
and net zero emissions and what priority innovations can GPST and related programs support in the next five years to support these goals? Yeah, good afternoon and good morning to all the panelists and the participants. Thanks for inviting us to be the GPST and uh, we are all, I mean, definitely enthusiastic to join and share the knowledge and all. And to the question that you asked is 100% renewable penetration and net zero, definitely it's a good to aim, but it's a tar target setting is a difficult one because there are a lot of things to be done. Uh, we need to have systems and processes have to be kept. Of course, uh, next five years, what we have to see is that we have to prepare a priority list of activities because each country has its own uh, statistic or kind of characteristics. So I feel it's an interesting thing and uh, we can, a uh, lot of things are there to see various aspects from cost, resources, availability and sustainability. Most important is that similar to that of ESCOM, they, we are also a very thermal predominant uh, power system and moving from uh, large thermal, we have about 70% is the thermal uh, predominance. So moving to renewables, and it's a, I mean, time uh, we have programmed, of course, by 2030, we will move to more than 40% and like that. So Lord, GPSC, this platform will definitely help us in uh, getting a better engagement with the standards. Very important point is, and one more thing is that assessment of uh, conformity to the standards, how the grid codes, how the people will be complying with it. There are plenty of issues which we need to develop because everyone is learning. Everybody is so we have, as uh, Secretary Jennifer mentioned said that we have to learn from each other and lean on each other. So I think GPST is an excellent uh, platform where we can uh, learn things. And important point is that we have to evolve flexibility matrix, performance measures, how incentivize the, uh, the, all the private players, develop a, a flexibility across the power system and the power sector ecosystem actually. So getting the knowledge, integration of the next penetration, how, how penetration has to be handled. So I think uh, we are already in touch with uh, through GO15 also, and this also is going to become a, a value adding uh, platform and so we share large ISOs, practices, market designs, and many things. So this way it is going to be, a, I mean, uh, we are looking forward a lot towards this collaboration. Thank you, KVS. Uh, over to you, Thomas. Well, thank you very much, Christy, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Well, at, uh, in Aginet, we, we normally talk about the first and second phase of the transition towards renewable energy. So in the first phase, towards 50% fluctuating renewables in the power system, we focused on reinforcing an already strong grid and building interconnectors to neighboring countries. So this, of course, to level out the fluctuating uh, production from wind and solar in a larger geographical area and provide the system stability. So a strong grid is definitely part of the equation. But in the second phase towards 100% uh, renewables, we, we will see deep electrification of our societies. More electricity used directly in the transport sector in heating and various industrial processes. And also indirect electrification where electricity is converted to hydrogen and further into various green fuels. Uh, what is commonly known as power to X. And I think this is, this is a necessary technology to decarbonize sectors uh, hard to electrify directly, such as heavy transport, aviation, uh, international shipping, etc. So near 100% renewable energy penetration will require huge amounts of flexibility, sector coupling, and in particular advances in, in hydrogen and power to X technologies. Electrification will, of course, also increase the demand for electricity and renewables, uh, but could also offer new sources of flexibility uh, for the energy system. 
I think much of this new demand could and should be flexible demand and, and Powell's X production facilities may provide various services needed to stabilize the energy system. So in, in areas with good access to wind and solar resources, the, the power system could actually come close to 100% renewable energy within the next 10 to 15 years. In Denmark, we actually expect the production of electricity from renewables to, to match electricity consumption uh, 100% already by 2030 on, on a yearly basis, primarily based on wind and solar, but also with some energy from biomass and biogas. But as I said, I mean, the Danish system is very well integrated with neighboring countries. So, so for a closed power system, I think it, it would take some more years for, for the transition to 100% renewables. But technically, I think actually considerable parts of the world, not just us in Denmark, have to be in a position to operate such, such a system uh, by 2030. And then this brings me uh, to the last part of your question, because as we've moved towards 100% renewables, we also move towards huge amounts of inverter-based wind and solar in, in the system. And this is a huge challenge to operate a system with much fewer traditional power plants delivering inertia and, and stability. So we need system R&D to obtain this uh, capability, new analytical tools, development of control room features, uh, developing new black start solutions, et cetera. And, and we need strong global cooperation to cope with these challenges because we, we don't have much time. And here I think GBSD can really encourage the needed cooperation between universities, system operators and, and, and industry. So, so, so to us, this is really where GPST can, can make a significant difference within, within the next uh, five years, uh, I think. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas. Obviously, it's really insightful to hear the diversity of issues and solutions that each country is having to use and, and tailor um, to their, I think as Secretary Granholm said, their individual um, citizens, their individual institutions, and uh, it's also clear that GPSD is uh, making sure that there's cooperation and collaboration among countries to allow for that, for that tailored support. So I have one final question that we're gonna do a bit of a lightning round before we turn to our concluding speaker. Um, and, and this question goes to all uh, participants in the round table and we'll be creative and go in the order that we just had the speakers go. And so I'll, I'll turn to you first, Michael. What are the highest value elements of the GPST and related programs in strengthening technical collaboration and knowledge sharing across institutions and countries to, tra to transition to advanced low emissions power systems? So Michael, may I turn it to you first? Yeah, thank you, uh, Christy. I, I look, for us, we probably see the highest value here in that kind of transformation dialogue and bringing together as much of that um, horsepower and intellect as we possibly can. Uh, it's very rare sometimes to get some of the smartest minds to collaborate on key issues. And, and I think for us, that's probably where the highest value of the GPST really comes together. Um, this strength of technical collaboration can't be understated in terms of its value. And um, you know, I think it was mentioned by one of our other speakers, um, environments are quite different and the timeframes and implementations are as well. But you know, being able to share some of those early experiences with you know, some of those uh, countries that are actually experiencing them first will certainly help um, other participants in the GPST. Thanks, Michael. May I turn to you next, Cesar? Yes, Christy, thank you. Uh, I think this is a very short answer. I think the highest value from GPST would be, first of all, the knowledge they have accumulated by lots of research, then the experience of the operators, they, they have deal with these problems many years. So they, they've lived with the problem, they solved the problem. And the ability to transmit this knowledge and experience to other countries like ours that, that uh, are beginning the process. But above all, what I see the highest value is that, that we have heard all, all, all the morning is the will of this uh, consortium to reunite and help others. I think this is the highest value we, we can point. 
the will to help others to share all the knowledge. It would be, thank you, Christy. Thank you, Cesar. Um, Andre, would you like to go next? Yeah, great. Um, so I think the uh, unique focus on system operators per se is um, a great uh, and unique characteristic of this venture. And the fact that we can assemble all of the um, global expertise in a structured forum instead of uh, having to go through individual connections. I think that that is the attraction to allow us to accelerate, to expedite, and to uh, gain our knowledge and understanding in a far uh, quicker way than would otherwise have been the case. So acceleration of learning and exchange of ideas, I think, is, uh, is what we look forward to achieving from this. Thanks, Andre. Um, KBS? Yeah. Yeah. I, the, first of all, I also agree that knowledge sharing is most important. And we will learn, actually, there are so many similarities and divergences across so many countries in terms of organizations, key mechanisms, our institutions. So, I mean, this will become an excellent uh, platform to, I mean, share our understanding or improve upon and having India also has a large grid connected and uh, it's one of the largest grids also. So we can share our own experiences and uh, get, so uh, the institutional framework is going to be very strong. And so we can, and one more important thing is that it is not that word, so we, to, we can share our actions and all. So that is the, I mean, most I feel the, pinnacle of it is that how best we can, how quickly we can put things into actions. So in that way, I feel this is uh, nice. And that is the most valued, I feel. Thank you, KBS and Thomas. Well, thank you. I, I think I will restrict myself to, to basically two comments uh, because I, I, I would first of all emphasize that GPST establishes new cooperations between system operators, universities, and, and the industry to, to tackle the challenges that we face towards 100% uh, renewables. And, and I think we, we also need GBST to keep focusing on raising funding for globally shared R&D within uh, renewably uh, energy-based power systems. Because it, it's not easy, actually, to attract funding for R&D in, in, let's say, behind the scenes, the behind the scenes system challenges. But solving these challenges is necessary actually to operate systems with 100% renewables and, and is in fact an extremely important challenge to try to solve. I think we, we know as system operators that, that a key challenge is to ensure stable and resilient operation of the system when wind and solar dominates the production. It, and it's, it sounds very simple, but, but this is actually often overlooked by others. So I think the, these are the two important aspects of GPST, drawing attention to this challenge and also fostering new cooperations that we, we need to solve the challenges. Uh, these, these are the two most important things as I see it. So thank you very much. Thanks, Thomas. And as now, now uh, you guys have been really very efficient in this panel. I was wondering if I could bring Elliot into this discussion a little bit um, and have you respond to the question of what are the highest value elements of GPST uh, from your perspective? Well, certainly many of the critical elements have been mentioned, but I think from the very first moment I was introduced to this effort, what really resonated with me was the focus on the system operator. You know, we, our folks that are in our control centers are simultaneously trying to drive innovation and creativity, but also with that profound sense of responsibility for reliability. And the development of really pragmatic and applicable tools 
and, and, and answering research questions that can solve issues ranging from ramping of wind and solar projects to the next generation of storage technologies, uh, figuring out new state awareness and visibility tools. That so deeply resonates with the people that are actually operating with the system that it's extremely engaging. It's something that I know we're very excited to be part of at the California ISO as we move towards the next big push for decarbonization here in our region. So I think it's just a fabulous premise and I'm really excited about how we're getting launched here today. Thank you. Thanks, Elliot. You know, I think we may have time um, for one more lightning round question before we turn it to Elliot for his concluding remarks, um, assuming people will keep to very quick responses. Um, so I'm gonna take the, the moderator's prerogative and ask, a question about uh, priorities. Um, we've heard from you that you know, you're juggling technical challenges, regulatory challenges, financial challenges. How do you prioritize um, what set of things you're working on um, in your respective countries and institutions? So I'll ask folks to be quick because I don't want to cut um, Elliot's final remarks short, but um, Michael, can we start with you again? Yeah, look, I think um, might've been mentioned by one of our earlier speakers. Um, it really is the combination of kind of planning, policy, regulatory and operational. Um, in isolation, uh, you know, it's very hard to address any individual issue. When it comes to prioritisation, you really need to look at a suite of these successfully. And that's something that's happening uh, here right now. Um, you know, AMO is really concentrated on developing uh, together with industry and participants as much of that collective view and forward view as we possibly can. So. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think there's a single winner in this. A single focus probably won't solve solve the challenge. We'll see if, if others um, come with the first, um, but I appreciate that response, Michael. Cesar. Yes, as Michael said, it's very difficult to pick one. Uh, it's always a combination, but if I have to, to, to choose one, I think that as regulatory framework is out of our scope because we are not government, we are a, a, a private ISO. Uh, I think that we would like to prioritize the, the development of technical solutions for the control rooms for us. So we'll be ready when the framework comes to, to the country, to so the new framework comes to the country. So these technical issues and the development of techniques and, and new technology is, is uh, in first place for us. Thanks, Cesar. Um, Andre? Rascal? Yeah, thanks, uh, Christia. I think uh, agreeing with uh, colleagues that went before me, um, one element that I, that I would like to emphasize is the uh, systems approach. How do, we, how do we integrate? How do we make the various systems work uh, collectively and harmoniously across the board so that we can ensure maximum reliability of supply across the grid? And I think, again, exchanging best practice across the group is uh, what, what we anticipate uh, deriving from this initiative. Thanks. Great, KBS? Yeah, I think to agree with them. The reliability and security is the first and foremost, being we are the system operators and uh, we are not the regulators. So, so integration of the systems and maintain, for maintaining and important point is that enabling all the technological interventions and in, uh, evolutions we have to keep respecting and re reliability and security have to be at the highest priority. So this would be our focus. Great, and Thomas? <laughs> Well, I, I think I would uh, use the word uh, super flexibility. How do we ensure super flexibility of our uh, system through flexible flexibility on the demand side, uh, sector integration, in particular between electricity and gas systems through, uh, through hydrogen, uh, digitally based uh, business models, uh, artific artificial intelligence in our control rooms, uh, these uh, these these sort of things and, and they all have a common denominator, namely super flexible and extremely integrated energy systems. That that's what we're working on. And Elliot, can I bring you into this as well? 
Yes, I think certainly for a system for system operators, you know, reliability is always, of course, priority number one. But one of the things that's so wonderful about the GPST is it's also really important for us to be able to carve out that time and that space to be thinking strategically about where we're evolving, what's happening one, three, five, 10, 15 years down the line so that we can get ahead of those issues, get ahead of those questions and start developing solutions today to resource issues that will really start manifesting themselves in even greater scale a little bit further down the line. So I really appreciate the opportunity and in, in the focus of where we're headed and where we're evolving uh, as an industry. Thanks so much. Um, I thought that was a really insightful discussion. Again, it's just um, rare to bring forward and to bring together this um, level and uh, set of diverse voices to share your experiences and priorities and challenges. And also to think about um, how G GPST can help respond to those challenges through collaboration and, um, and, and technical support and advice. So um, thank you panelists uh, for your contributions. And uh, now I would like to turn it to Elliot Mainzer, president and CEO of the California Independent System Operator for his closing remarks. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Christy. And as we, as we move towards the close of, of today's session, I'd, I'd like to start uh, by expressing my appreciation to Secretary of Energy Granholm uh, Secretary of State Quartang, the, the GPST organizers, and, and all of the participants in today's launch. It's, it's really been a, a fabulous and I think very inspiring event. At the California ISO, we're, we're proud to, to represent a state and a country that is deeply committed to addressing climate change and driving towards a more sustainable zero carbon electricity system. Just this past March 13th, uh, we saw 92% of our load served by renewables. And just last week, we achieved our record for bulk system solar production at 13,151 megawatts. We're now planning for a summer operation with 2,000 megawatts of battery storage resources, which will provide a whole new set of operational opportunities and challenges. And as a result, I'm really very pleased and quite proud to be a founding member of the Global Power Systems Transformation Consortium and to do our own part to step up to the important leadership role that Finton described in his opening comments. I think the conversation today has, has highlighted the value of the GPSD consortium in identifying the most pressing and relevant challenges associated with power system operations with large amounts of renewable energy, driving cutting edge research on those topics, and then using existing and new networks of relationships to disseminate the research findings and help accelerate the global transformation to reliable, sustainable, and carbon-free power systems. Several of the themes from today's discussion particularly resonated. I, I really appreciated uh, Secretary of Energy Granholm's emphasis on urgency, deployment, and sharing solutions. She stated that you know, none of us individually is as smart as all of us together. And Secretary of State Quarteng re-emphasized her theme of the importance of shared progress and that sense of urgency. Finton Sly emphasized the leadership responsibilities and that call for action by the founding system operators, operators providing another echo of the call for urgency in addressing global, the global challenge of climate change with a truly global response. We also heard of the focus and commitment to clean energy from a diverse set of countries, including Indonesia, South Africa, Australia, Denmark, Peru, and India, that's really going to help sharpen the relevance and dissemination and that tailoring of solutions of the GPST research agenda and results. And I also certainly appreciate uh, Larry Kolb's call for a modernized, reliable, resilient, and secure grid for the clean energy, to, to meet the clean energy goals of tomorrow, something that is very important to all of us founding system operators and those who will benefit, I think, significantly from this initiative. So I know personally, I've already very much benefited from the strength and working relationships uh, with my fellow transmission system operators in the research community. I'm very excited about the capacity of the GPSD consortium to make a deep and meaningful impact in the drive for decarbonization. And, I, and I'm looking forward to the next steps as we further refine our research agenda, begin bringing specific research projects into production, further build our networks and expand on the other pillars of the initiative and fully unlock the power 
of international collaboration. So thank you again uh, for the opportunity to offer a few comments this morning. It's been a fabulous event and best wishes to all of you. Look, look forward to working with you. Thanks so much, Elliot. I, th I think it's clear um, that all the participants really realize the value of, of this initiative and are looking forward uh, to continue and deepen the engagement. Um, it's been really um, a pleasure for me and I think our, our really big audience here today to listen to um, the priorities, the challenges, the solutions that you are facing in your individual and respective um, countries and institutions. So thanks so much um, for handling the concluding remarks and summing up um, so I don't have to, but um, just wanted to underscore the urgency deployment and shared action that we heard from many of the, of the speakers and, and panelists. Um, to learn more about the work of the consortium or become involved in the research activities, please, vi please visit globalpst.org. And also, you know, we are aware that the uh, questions are, are rolling in for the participants and thank you for sending those in. Anyone who sent a chat question, um, please know that the, the GPST team will follow up with any outstanding questions after this. I'm sorry, we couldn't address those um, individually, but um, thank you for sending those in. And I think some, if I saw them, um, if I read them as they came up, um, were actually addressed by some of the panelists. So with that, uh, we had an efficient crew, so we'll end a bit early and um, enjoy the, the rest of your respective days and evenings. And thanks so much for your participation and attendance. Thank you. Thank you to all of you. Thanks, and also thanks to NREL for, for you, organizing you. such a good event. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. It was a great thanks. event. Bye -bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.